Uh, Alex was asked um, by the rural dean to give a reflection uh, to the clergy uh, on the believing in the living God and the coronavirus pandemic. And I, I was at the talk and I thought other people might really enjoy what Alex had to say. So I'm going to interview him. Um, I'm just giving him an opportunity to ex tell you uh, what he's been thinking about this during this time. And it started with Alex working in his garden. What were you doing, Alex? <laughs> it was about 10 weeks ago now. Um, so just before, no, no, probably three months ago now. Um, so just, just the days that all this was kicking off, I was in my back garden um, trying to lay some turf to turn what was once an anti-aircraft battery and then afterwards the turning circle for the tuk-tuk of Ronaldo's ice cream into a, into a garden so Rachel could run around in it. Um, so that's how I was out there sort of trying to do that. And I think a neighbour put his head over the fence possibly to see what you were doing and asked you a question. What was the question he asked you? Well, my neighbour's quite a, a straight talking uh, chap and he popped his head over the wall and said, so is, all, is this all God's will then? Um, I should have been able to think of something constructive to say, but I couldn't think of anything at that particular moment. So I had to settle for an attempt at a joke instead. So I said something along the lines of, well, if it is, then we've got bigger things to worry about or something like that. And ever since he asked me that, I've been wondering what I should have said to him. So Alex, how did you start to organise your thoughts? Well, the, the problem with that question is this God's will then uh, towards any sort of suffering or, or bad thing is that there's any, any number of ways you can cut that question. You can come at it through sort of, what well, you know, a hard-nosed systematic. Um, you know, the, the way that tries to draw a logical relationship between different areas of theology. So what's the relationship between God's sovereignty and human freedom, for example, or through apologetics, um, making, a, a, making a defense or making an account of the Christian faith. Um, so what's the relationship between God's kindness and the reality of suffering? Or you can come at it through questions around the church. So what does it mean? for us to um, be, the, be the church when we can't meet physically. Um, or you could even come at it through an apocalyptic lens. How does all this relate to the fact that we're a people who are waiting for the return of Christ? Um, my two pennies worth though comes from a different perspective, which is a perspective called dogmatics. So having chosen this, you need to tell us what dogmatics means before yeah. you go any further. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested in Christian confessions. So I'm interested in how Christians have spoken about God in the past and, and using that to try to help us talk about God and his kindness to us today. So the question that comes from um, dogmatics, that, this, that, that area is, um, how have Christians given, given witness to their faith in the past and how does that shape our response to this present situation? So I turn to a very particular confession that Christians have made in the past called the Nicene Creed. This was written in the fourth century and it's that confession, it's, it's that confession of faith that we say together on a Sunday, but particular when we celebrate Holy Communion. Now what, one of the reasons I was drawn to this particular confession was because it makes one very simple division between God, God's reality that's eternal, that is, was and always will be, and our reality as creatures, um, our reality that depends on another in order to exist, our created reality that might not have been. Um, this is the fundamental distinction that this confession is trying to make and hold. And there are all sorts of historical and theological reasons why it was needing to do that. But what's important for now is that at the heart of this confession is the question of the relationship between God and creation. Um, and in contrast to lots of systems of thought around the same time, the, the, the confession that they wrote at Nicaea makes a very simple statement about this. 
there are no semi-divine beings sort of in between God and creation. There's no mythology of us being eternal spirits that are trying to get our way back up through the various levels, back up to heaven again. It's not, it, it's not a cluttered understanding of that relationship. It's much more simple than that. For, the, for this statement, there is, for the composers of this statement, there is God and there is everything else. What's God is God and what's everything else is everything else. And it underpins this difference by this relationship it, it draws between the way the Son comes out from the Father and the way that we creatures come out from the Father. Now, um, this was the hot topic of the day. And they would have been speaking about this in market stalls and in pubs. In fact, there were drinking songs that were written to promote various um, theological ideas around all this. So does the Son come out from the Father in the same way we do? Is the Son created, in other words? Does the Father will him into being? Or is, the son, or is God the Son always coming out from the Father as a necessary expression of the way God has his life? Um, and the, the, the confession, this creed makes a really important statement. It says the Son is eternally coming out from the Father. He's God from God, light from light, true God from true God. And then the, the big bit, begotten, not made. And it, it's there in that statement that it makes this difference between this necessary relationship of God the Father and God the Son and this other sort of relationship between God and creation. Because in the Father-Son relationship, there's no choice. It's the way God is. But in the God-creation relationship, there's choice. So I've, I've heard you talk about this before. And... Um, I I have it, it's really helped me it's re, it's really helped me um we we say these words on a on a regular basis and I had never thought about the detail of it I had never thought about the begotten and and not made and the implications of it and um, because it it comes from from detail it what feels like to me detail but when you start looking at that detail it then turns out to be really profound just in a such a few words so so alex how how do you then link with why this matters so much to us hmm. it does sound a bit strange to be asked a question about this coronavirus and then go to this creed that didn't have any um wasn't making a statement about that at all but it, it it's in, it, I find it helpful because it tells us about what creation is uh, by contrasting it to what it isn't it lets us know what creation is like what sort of thing we are where we've come from because the son and the father are eternally in a relationship in the power of the Holy Spirit this is the way God is but creation comes into being in a different way it's made not begotten so it's not an, it's not necessary god in some sense has chosen to bring creation into being and that's got two really important implications um first it means that creation is wanted god chose to bring us into being out of his love um but the second thing that that um this means is that creation might not have been it wasn't necessary that creation existed like the far, like the sun existed. This, uh, this, the, the word that, get, that theologians use to describe that is a word called contingent. Um, that's a word that means something is dependent on something else. Creation is dependent on God. And, and because of that, cre it might, creation might not have existed. Now that's a really important point because it means that for creation, non-existence is always just teetering there over the horizon. It's where we've come from and it's where we could return to. So this means, well, what stops us sliding back into non-existence? Paul puts it like this in Colossians. He says, in Christ, all things hold together. Um, the, the word through whom all things were made is the one through whom the, the things that have been brought out, brought into being from nothing, don't just slip back into nothingness. Uh, this helps us understand why the Bible always links sin to death. 
because to sin is to turn away from God. It's to turn away from the word of God through which all things hold together. So if you turn your back on the source of life and the source of order, then you've got nothing to turn to except to death and to chaos. Uh, this is the story of the opening chapters of Genesis where God speaks the world into existence and he draws order and he draws order out of that, that, out of that swirling chaos of the deep, those deep waters. And the story of the opening chapters of Genesis is the return of creation from that order that, and life that God's given to the chaos of the flood in Noah, uh, of the flood in the story of Noah. Um, this is something that theologians call the mystery of sin as we turn from life and towards um, chaos and the disintegration of God's creation. But this is where the goodness of the gospel comes in. This is where the wonder of the gospel comes in because that word through whom all things were made and by whom all things hold together has come into creation and he has shared with us in that downward spiral into disintegration or in the language of Paul Jesus shares in our flesh he shares in that fragility of our humanity that's vulnerable to the power of sin and he shares in our flesh so that we might be drawn to share in his body he shared in our collapse into non-existence so that we might share in his resurrection and ascension into new life Having looked at a bit of science recently and ha heard a bit of scientific comment, I I've, I've found this really interesting because the physicists are telling us that everything is heading towards collapse, that, that you know, that's what the physicists are telling us. And it, it then gives the profound nature of Jesus and rescuing us from collapse and nothingness a, a very a, um just earth shattering uh reality um which which is 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 a sort of whole set of bigger thoughts than than we're used to mm. because 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 we need Jesus on a daily basis we, we're inclined to domesticate our our relationship with him mm. um, but to be reminded of this cosmic um, reality I've, I've found really helpful and, and I think Alex you you, you then you've then found um, a, a an artwork um that that brings us back to the question that you were asked about this present earthy reality of of suffering which has always been around but this artwork was was painted at another time of of pandemic mm. wasn't it well um, it was I've, I've just i've got it here so i'll um just get it up Yeah, this is um this is one of my favorite pieces of art actually it's um from an altar piece in a town called eisenheim and it's just going to scroll through with various um various parts of it um jesus is on the cross and he's sort of contorted in that strange way and i like it because it shows god the son incarnate in sort of a really brutal way sharing our sharing in our suffering and I need things to be this um, obvious and this in your face for me to get. He's sharing in that vulnerability and that possibility of death. Um, and one of the things that re I really like about this is Eisenheim, cha the, the chapel in which this, this uh, picture, is, this painting is, was in a chapel in a hospital for those suffering from the plague. If you just go back to that one, you can see all over Jesus's body are marks of the plagues of boils and that sort of thing. And there was another condition I understand called ergotism, which causes the stretching of the fingers that people in this hospital were suffering with. 
and Jesus's and John the Baptist's fingers in this picture both sort of bear those marks. The idea that it's sort of talking out is that Jesus has shared in the suffering of the patients of that hospital. And in that place, he's acted as their high priest and has said a couple of things that are really important on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, on the cross, he acknowledges the, the foolishness and the cruelty of what's happening to him. But he speaks out words of mercy and words of peace. And he also says something else. He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, just there on the cusp of death, in the face of all this suffering and pain, he commits his spirit in faith to his father. So he gives this expression of confidence, of, of, of belief that the father will raise him to life again. And I think right there is the, is the essence of our Christian confession. To, on the one hand, to acknowledge the arbitrariness, the cruelty and the suffering that's around us, to not turn our face from it because it's, it's there, to not turn our face from the, it's built into what we are as created things. We've come out from non-existence and we could go back into it at any moment, except for the goodness and the love of God and the power of God toward us in Jesus Christ. Because the good news of the gospel is that God hasn't left his world in that downward spiral into nothingness. God has entered into it and stopped it in its tracks and turned it round the other way. He's gathered it all up into himself and God the Son has included it in his response of faith to the Father. And the wonderful, um, the wonderful news of the Gospel is that we all share in what Jesus has already done. We share in that, in his faithfulness, in his faithful response to the Father. And from that place, we can make our confession of faith in God as well. Um, we can acknowledge the, the suffering and the unfairness and the randomness of what happens. But in that, it give an expression of our confidence in the goodness of the Father, who won't leave us spiralling into nothing, but has sent the Son and the power of the Spirit to draw us into the Son's life and the Son's response to the Father. As, as you talked about the picture, um, something came to mind that hadn't before. And, and I guess it's about the, the, the various, so many different ways in which people suffer. Because I just happen to know that ergotism comes from a fungus that forms little grains in, in, and is then ground down and it it pollutes bread so when you're eating ordinary bread if it's got ergot in it this fungus you you're then poisoned mm -hmm. and whereas the the plague comes we think from it's a bacteria from bites from fleas comes at a, a you know completely different way mm -hmm. and we're talking at the moment about virus and and my dad had virus polio, which completely changed his life. And just the and and now, you know, today we're talking about racism and the awfulness of that, and misuse of power in so many different ways. And and suffering comes in so many different ways. Mm. Um, and the specifics, but Jesus takes the deepest suffering that that humanity um experiences and 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 deals and and enters into it and i i just think it's it's extraordinary really and so you've come a whole you, you you've um you've done a lot of thinking you didn't have a chance to do it on your feet when your <laughs> neighbor put his head over I, I know that feeling. <laughs> ah. So what would you say to him now if, if he put his head over it, the fence again? Yeah, I think n now what I'd say to that question, is this, is this pandemic God's will then? 
I think my response would be, um, viruses are cruel. God is good. Hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> we would say it, St. Stephen's. <laughs> seriously, seriously good news. <laughs> and I, I agree with you. Viruses <laughs> can be cruel, but God is good. Thanks, Alex. You're welcome. Thank you.